Hi, I'm Femi O'K and you're in the stream. Today, a look inside the International Criminal Court with its former prosecutor, Luis Moreno Ocampo. So, how often do you get to ask a world-famous prosecutor questions? Today is that day. Malika Palau is looking out for our live feedback online. Yeah. Questions that are already coming in. Great. What do you see? Well, it's a fact like that, the world-famous prosecutor that has people online so excited. Sure. And of course, a topic like the ICC is one that's perfect for an international audience. So as Femi said, the questions are already coming in from all around the world. But of course, there's still room for more. So you can send us your live comments and questions. Just make sure you use the hashtag AJStream. Now, we'll be hearing in just a moment from Luis Moreno Ocampo. He'll be joining us from Boston, Massachusetts. And we'll have more from Luis in just a moment. Hello, my name is Gilles de Kerkhove, I'm the European Union Counter-Terrorist Coordinator and I am in the street. Before we get the conversation started, let me give you a brief introduction. Luis Moreno Acampo rose to prominence in his home country, prosecuting top officials from Argentina's so-called dirty war. Now, back in 2003, he was elected as the first prosecutor of the newly established International Criminal Court for a nine-year term. During his tenure, he opened investigations into nine situations like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Darfur and Kenya. He also issued dozens of arrest warrants and got a conviction for crimes against humanity. Several cases he initiated are still being examined. The International Criminal Court is often called the court of last resort and pursues the worst type of cases. And we're talking about cases like genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. 123 states are party to the ICC. Palestine became the newest member on April the 1st. Now also joining Luis Moreno Acampo on the program, we have Evan Sank Mars from New York, Atta Hindi in Ramallah, Palestine, and Samar al Balushi in Mombasa, Kenya. So it's great to have you all here in the stream. Now, before we get Louise Moreno Acampo joining us, um, Evan, if you were going to sum up what it is the ICC has done for the global community, what would you say? I think that the court has played a good deterrent role in terms of preventing some of the most heinous crimes that we've seen since Rwanda and Srebrenica. I'd say its deterrent effect has been overall very positive, and yeah. there are still steps to be made, but I think it's made an important contribution. Who's been deterred? Who's been deterred from war crimes or genocide because of the ICCs? Could you say, for instance, that situation, that's not as bad because the ICC is there as a threat, as a warning? I think the, the most successful example was the case of Cote d'Ivoire in and around 2004, 2005, and around up to 2006. Uh. The court's role really did play a deterrent effect in making officials that could be responsible or possibly, possibly perpetrate atrocities think twice. Sure. Well, you know, it's interesting that Evan started with that idea of deterrence. We got a Facebook comment here from Migs Montreal. This person writes in, the prevention of genocide and mass atrocity crimes is one of the objectives, but the preventative effect is hard, if not possible, to measure. If yeah, I might yeah, jump in, sure. Just, just on that point quickly, yeah, I Evan. think it, this, this point is critical. I mean, with respect to expectations, when we look at things like the International Criminal Court, the responsibility to protect, for example, the expectations are massive. And, and the metric by which we judge success is for, you know, how do we, how does it deliver for the people on the ground? For example, I've traveled to the Central African Republic. The court has opened up preliminary investigations into the situation in CAR, but it's been almost over a year now since we've seen any significant measure uh, of justice for this particular crisis. And CAR has faced an impunity gap for decades and decades. So managing expectations is crucial, and I think the key concern or key question we should have is wh what is the deliverable for the citizen on, on the ground in these situations and how they've been impacted by the crimes under the court's jurisdiction, and is the court living up to those expectations because they are truly massive, especially in situations where we don't have um, adequate judicial mechanisms or systems in place or they've been broken as a result of conflict. So we're joined now by Luis Moreno Ocampo, who's in Boston, Massachusetts. We see him. We just had a slight audio issue there. But Luis, it's great to have you jump into this conversation now so we can ask you some of the questions that, that our online community have been asking. But first, what 
are you proudest of from your work at the ICC? What would you point to and say, I am proud and I stand by this work? What would you say? Well, the world took a very complex decision in 1998 to adopt the supranational criminal justice system. Never in the life before ha this happened. Nuremberg was an ad hoc tribunal, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, just for specific cases. This idea to provide a permanent system to protect individuals all over the world, that is huge change. That's why it creates so much controversy. And uh, when I was appointed, my job was to establish a system. Because in those days, in 2003, was in the middle of the Iraq intervention, uh, many people were thinking the Rome status and the core will collapse. I remember I was teaching here at Harvard in those days. A colleague of mine, a professor, told me, Luis, it's a great honor to be the prosecutor, but you should reject it because you will be in nine years at The Hague uh -huh. doing nothing and receiving a salary because without so U.S. support, you can do nothing. Okay. Well, Luis, you mentioned that you're proudest that the court was established. So online, we're getting in questions for you. They're coming in fast and furious. This is from Marie, and she wants to know what your biggest disappointment or disillusionment was uh, under the ICC. No, personally for me, it was in such an interesting journey. I was nine years doing incredible activities. I am pretty disappointed for the Darfurians, for instance, because the court received a mandate to investigate the crimes. We indict different, uh, inter, uh, different persons there, including the person of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, and the world is doing nothing. It's ignoring the genocide on Darfur. And if, if you are in Darfur and the government is attacking you, who will defend you? So you're expecting the Security Council will do it, but now what could be your hopes? That for me the most, it's not about me, it's about Darfuris who are suffering a genocide and the world is doing nothing to protect them. The fact that you don't have a way of going in and picking up people that you've decided have committed crimes against humanity or war crimes, do you think that is one of the major limitations of the ICC? The problem is not that, because there is no judge in the world who has his own or her own police. The issue is in, in national states, the police is following instructions. And that happened also in the 123 states members of ICC. The police arrest people in Congo, in France, in Belgium, no problem. The issue more difficult is how to arrest Joseph Kony, who is in the bush fighting. How to arrest a head of state as a as uh, President Bashir, that the complexity, and it's not a police operation. Uh -huh. We need a, a commitment of the global leaders that no, no one can commit genocide. And that commitment is missing. That is the problem. It's not about the police. It's about leadership. And when you talk about uh, that commitment, that brings me to a point that a lot of people online are making. Now, of course, for those of you at home, if you've been following along on the Streams app, you know that the majority of people mm. online want to talk about something in particular, and that is Africa. So Osman writes in, why are European and American leaders not prosecuted by the ICC? Uh, lots more people are saying that they think there is a perceived Africa mm. bias. Um, <coughs> I, I, I want to get your take on that, Luis, but of course, I know that someone has a thought along those same lines. And so, Samad, why don't you direct that to Luis? Sure. And actually, if I could just first respond Look. to something that uh, Luis just mentioned, and that is the, the complexity or lack of complex complexity around the enforcement aspect of the court, right? So needing to depend on some kind of police force in order to apprehend its suspects. I would just be curious. First, I'm struck by the fact that you say that's not complex, because surely that has to be one of the most complex aspects of the court's work, right? Actually physically apprehending the suspect and bringing them to trial. And as you mentioned, that, that endeavor has been extremely complicated in the case of Joseph Kony, which is what led you to then seek the cooperation not only of the Ugandan government, but also of the U.S. government, and specifically the U.S. military. And I'm just curious how you could seek out such a partnership with an entity that you know to be a flagrant violator of human rights and, and also to be known to be uh, evading the ICC's uh, powers in the first place. Okay, first, the court is not in charge of arrest. 
No, in no country in the world, the courts arrest people. The police arrest people. So the state arrest people. It's similar here. The state has to arrest people. When we issue a arrest warrant for Joseph, against Joseph Kony, that was crucially important for Uganda because Joseph Kony was terrorizing Uganda for 20 years and in part because the ICC intervention, Sudan expelled him from Sudan and then and the Uganda intervention and all the interventions, so there was no more crimes in, in Uganda. Uh, the problem is now Kony is terrorizing people in, in Central African Republic and Southern Sudan and how to control him. That is a territorial state. Uganda requests support to U.S. We never request support to U.S. because it's not our responsibility to arrest people. My responsibility was to indict people, judges review and make decisions, and now state has to arrest. Uganda, Central African Republic, requests U.S. support, and they are doing that. And, and uh, that, that is a different activity. And uh, stopping Joseph Kony <coughs> is important. It's very important because it's not people in Central African Republic who are African, are suffering, but because they are poor, no one talk about them. In Africa, there are, there are African killers I, and African I, victims. Yeah. I'd love to uh, go ahead, Summer, and I'd like to also say something. Uh, Atta, you go ahead. Summer, you had a chance. We're, yeah. we're, we're hold tight here. Summer, you can come back in the post show. Atta, okay. go ahead. What did you want to say? Uh, no, you know, very briefly, I kind of agree with Summer's, uh, this goes back to Summer's previous point. I agree. The ICC is not going to be the only solution, but at the same time, we have a very delicate situation where we look at something called individual criminal responsibility. It's an option. We look at something called state responsibility as an option. We look at uh, issues related to corporate crimes and, and non-state actors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only problem is, um, is that at times uh, we have uh, situations where the politics plays a large role, where, for example, a certain number of states will come to the Palestinians and say, listen, why don't you drop the ICC and look for transition justice mechanisms, but they'll go to Syria or Syria and say, Let's forget about the transitional justice mechanisms and let's just work on the ICC. And that's sort of part of the problem. But that also feeds into the other point that someone is making. I completely agree with her. Um, and I, this is a question also. In my experience, and I had worked for the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, and I had worked on other aspects related to the ICC, and I do so now in Palestine, is that we have a situation where I wonder to what extent the Office of the Prosecutor has continued with a policy that it had in order to ensure cooperation. And what that means is that working on cases that would ensure cooperation, which means that security council members in particular won't At, I'm going to push you just to ask a very direct question because we're running out of time on the show. Just very briefly, is that policy, do you think that policy of ensuring cooperation with respect to selecting cases, as was done in Libya, as was done in uh, Uganda, not going after the government, do you think that's been successful? In my opinion, that hasn't. Look, the court is working with states and inviting Uganda or Congo to refer case, the situation was helping us to work with them. And I would say when Uganda situation improved dramatically. In Congo it's also improving. It's highly complicated. In both countries it's complicated. But the situation in Ituri there are much less crimes. Kibbutz is better. Even Bosco and Taganda surrender himself. So in, in this we are not transforming Congo or Uganda into Sweden, but they are improving. They are improving. We need to do something similar in, 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 in Darfur and Central African Republic is back to problems. So different situations, different outcomes. And that's why we need to discuss how to do it in different countries. But I would say the ICC was never a problem. I think it's helping. We need to, to add actors helping to control violence and do justice. If, if I might jump in quickly and, and just make two quick points, I think there are two fundamental problems here. The first is that we're facing a changing threat environment, and the court is not exactly equipped to deal with it. The rise of non-state actors like Boko Haram and ISIL, the ISIL problem for the court is one that's pretty fundamental. And, and, and the second point, I think, is that we have a very complicated relationship between the court and the UN Security Council that's really come out of the woodwork with not only Sudan as a result of non-compliance, but also with Syria. And that poses challenges for for addressing ISIL as well, but the vetoes at the council have been detrimental in terms of referring the situation in Syria to the court. And I'd love to get, uh, Luis Monroe Campbell, your thoughts on how you see that relationship evolving given just how toxic it has been between the council and the International Criminal Court. No, well, the relation is simple. Security Council can decide to refer situation from non-state parties, and they did it in Darfur and in Libya. And that relation, then Security Council is not doing something more. 
and the, that, 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 that's the relation we have. Uh, and we, re we report to them, we brief them, but the court issued a warrant now we have to implement, and through the council is not doing that. Of course, there are other problems. There are environmental problems, there are corruption problems, the court is not dealing with them, but the court is the beginning. That's why we should still think how to do better the court, not just in ISIS or Boko Haram, but also with Darfur. You are forgetting Darfur. We cannot forget Darfur. So we have to deal with the crimes, and the court will be there to help, but some other actors should join, and we have to keep moving ahead. And then that's why we have to understand how the system is working, and how we can, what pieces of the system are not working. Luis, if you could prosecute anybody in the world for the mandate that the ICC currently has, who would you bring to the ICC? You know, what's my, on, my your, line what's on the, the top of your day, list? The best outcome of the court, zero case is the best outcome. Mm. That no one is committing genocide, no yes. one is committing crimes against humanity. That's the goal. It's, it's not to prosecute more people, it's to have no crimes. That is, the, that is the goal. And the problem today is the world is going to war to war. I see, I'm very worried about what happened with ISIS in Syria and Iraq, but I, I see the connection between bombing and producing this reaction. And that's why justice is alternative. I am here at Harvard because we are discussing here how to create an alternative, because US decided to, to do, to, in, in, on September 11, mm. President Bush decided that terrorists was no more a law enforcement activity, it was war against terror. And that created more, more, more gasoline to the fire, because then you increase the problem. And now, how we deal with this complicated situation in with ISIS? So that's why the idea to go back to the law and respect people and investigate crimes should be an alternative, not just to deal with ISIS, to deal with organized crime, uh -huh. cyber attacks, there are new forms of violence, and we are still thinking in, in remote time. Sure. Samar, what did you want to ask, Luis? Go ahead. Perhaps now that you're no longer in your position as chief prosecutor, you can share with the ways in which it is in, inherent to the nature of the court's work, right? The, the context in which you work, um, the challenges you face. If, for example, you are investiga investigating a head of state, as was the case in Kenya, um, what that means on a very practical level in terms of the limitations you face uh, as you conduct your work. No, but the, I, I, the court not political. The court put limits to the political actors. President Bashir could be a politician but cannot kill people to stay in power. And that is our clash with him. We ha I have nothing, I, I don't care about politicians, but I care about crimes. So the line, we are, we are drawing the line that you cannot commit massive yeah, atrocities please. to gain power or to retain power. That is the goal. So we are not politicians, we are putting limits to the politicians. That's why some but of some them of are clashing with us. But some of your own actions are political, right? So when you launched your investigations in Uganda, you did so alongside President Museveni. You were sitting next to him, knowing that he himself was responsible for some of no. the greatest violations of Uganda. Isn't that not what led so many Look, Ugandans to be disappointed from an, from an early point in that case and the prospects for, ju for justice? The, 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 uh, there were allegations against President Museveni, in particular for displacing almost 200,000 people from northern Uganda. My problem was that this happened before July 2002. And I can do nothing. I had no jurisdiction before July 2002. Therefore, President Museveni, in my time, did, I had no evidence that he committed massive atrocities. And in addition to that, he is the president of Uganda. So as an international prosecutor, I deal with presidents because that's the difference. When you're in a national setting, the prosecutor, I was a national prosecutor in Argentina. I did not need to discuss with the congressman because the, the, the system is settled. At the global level, I was alone. I was the prosecutor with no state. So I deal with the head of state to discuss with them, guys, I'm going to your case. I'm going to your country. You say, I will investigate your country. That's it. That's what I did with I met Museveni. I'm sorry. Um, can, I, can I jump in? So I do have a specific question um, and that I do want to ask before the time is over uh, to the, the former prosecutor. And it's particularly related to Palestine, of course. I can't go without asking this question. 
I'm curious about what was your legal reasoning behind um, the 2009 12-3 declaration, and that in that uh, rather than taking it to the pretrial chamber, how did you define your powers as a prosecutor to make such a decision not to proceed, or even the uh, powers of the Assembly of States parties to make a decision on the state of the Palestine? The, on the Palestine issue, 2009, Minister of Justice came to of Palestine came to my office. I explained to him, look, I understand it's a big step for you, but I cannot promise success. I, I can promise respect for the law and impartiality. And talking about the law, you have a problem because the law say a state can accept jurisdiction, and it's not clear that you're a state. The Minister of Justice requests me, let us brief you. It was brilliant. Let us brief you. Give us a fair time to brief you. I gave them the time. So they were briefing me for three years. When they ended, I decided, I said, look, I cannot move ahead because it's not clear that you're a state. Go to the General Assembly, go to the UN, request to be a state and come back. And they did it. And that's why now it's different. Now the business is different. That's why I think something important to happen in the, in the coming days, the UN Commission of Inquiry will make a report on Palestine. And that could be very important because then Palestine should decide what to do. I, I think it's a very important moment for Palestine-Israel relations. I think sign, as, as me became a big state party for Palestine, it's a big move because it's a commitment not to commit crimes. And Israel but should understand that, that and, 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 and support it. Why, I want to stay on this subject of Palestine. It became a member of the ICC at the beginning of April. There is a conundrum that I want to show our audience. So audience, take a look at this animation. So here you have Palestine coming forward and saying, listen, these crimes happened against our people in the war of Gaza in 2014. So let's say over 2,000 civilians were killed by Israeli military operations. But on the other side of that issue, 4,000 rockets, maybe more than 4,000 rockets, mortars were fired into Israel from Gaza. So is Palestine in the situation where they may well be victims, but also perpetrators? What happens where you have a, a member state like that, Luis? No, the prosecutor could decide to investigate crimes committed by Palestinians from Palestine mm -hmm. or from anyone who commits crimes in, in, in Palestine if, if, if she found that happened. So sure. the prosecutor could select the, the cases now in right. Palestine. Right. Malika, has that, has that inter hold, hold tight for a minute, guess, because we've got a lot more to talk about, and that, thank goodness we have a post-show for doing that. So we will take you all to the post-show at stream.aljazeera.com. I'm just going to check in to see what the online community are making of this conversation. Right, well, uh, people are enjoying it, but I think one of the biggest things that I'm seeing, aside, mm. of course, from that Africa discussion that we mentioned earlier, mm. is this, that not everyone is a signatory, of course, to the ICC. So Alex says there are notable signatories, but there are those who have not yet ratified or signed up to the Rome Statute, and that is, of course, the statute that dictates the ICC, and that includes uh, uh, states like the U.S. So I know that's something we can talk about in the post-show. How do you make this effective? Uh, and, and make a good, really good point. Have a look here on my laptop. I thought this might come up. This is the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So actually, who is uh, a member of the ICC? Everywhere where you see green in the world, that is a state party or a member of the ICC. Blue is a state party that has not entered into force, and yellow is a signatory that has not yet ratified. There we have the US, here we have Russia, and then some other countries across through North Africa and then through the African continent as well. I have one more comment from the online community via Malika. Well, uh, several people were very excited about this. One person in particular said she was passionate about the ICC. That's Natalia. She did write in, though, that she understands its limitations. She writes, its effectiveness depends on the cooperation of state parties and challenges arise if they refuse to cooperate, as Kenya or Sudan do. But this other person pushes back and he says, the good thing is that leaders now know they can be brought to justice. A culture of justice takes time to grow. Luis Morena Ocampo, we really appreciate your time with us today here on the stream. It's not easy having a conversation with a phone to your ear and being live on camera as well, but you did it brilliantly. Thank you also to Summer, Evan and Atta for giving you a workout with the questions and our online community as well. We really appreciate it. Thanks for making a very special edition of the stream. Until the next time, I'll see you online. Take care.